I'm Leslie Owens, the Executive Director of the MIT Center for Information Systems Research, MIT CISR. We are the co-organizer of today's event. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Jeannie Ross to deliver this year's academic keynote. Jeannie has been at MIT since 1993, and for many people, she is MIT CISR. For years, I have had a single book recommended to me again and again. It's called Enterprise Architecture as Strategy, the best-selling book co-authored by Jeannie, Peter Weil, and David Robertson. If you haven't yet, read it, and you will understand why Jeannie has earned a worldwide following of students, executives, and academics. Somehow, Jeannie makes time for all of us. She was founding editor of MIS Quarterly Executive and is a prolific writer with books and articles in all the premier journals, including the latest issue of Harvard Business Review. As a scholar, Jeannie pushes past hype jargon and the superficial. She seeks out complicated questions and wrestles with them until she gets to an elegant and robust solution. Her frameworks, like operating models and four-stage architecture, are legendary. They're taught at business schools and in boardrooms around the world. Her rigorous evidence-based research is why the world's best CIOs seek her out to get help to design their firms for success. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeannie Ross. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I know it's been a really long day. I'm a little worried your heads are probably ready to explode. But I hope you have time and the stamina to think intensely with me about the challenges of digital transformation. With my team at uh, MIT CISR, we've been studying digital transformation now for four years. And what we can say is obvious is that digital transformation is not about technology. Digital transformation is about redefining your value proposition. And then to deliver that value proposition, you'll have to redesign your company. That is really hard. And because it's so hard, I'd like to spend this session reviewing with you four decisions that we've identified that we believe will be critical to the success of any digital transformation. So first, let me just thank the sponsors and patrons of MIT CISR because it is, it is you who make this research possible and it's an honor to work with you. And then let me start by, by sharing with you the stories of three big old companies and how they're transforming. Schindler is an elevator company. But what's interesting about Schindler is that I realized what it does well is it moves people. In fact, it moves a billion people a day within buildings. And as they thought about the digital economy, they thought, well, wait a minute, we could move beyond that. We could deliver urban mobility solutions, or more recently, they call them smart mobility solutions. And to, and, and to explain what they meant by that, they, the, their first innovation was to send a message to registered guests, people who had not yet arrived at, at a Schindler-equipped building, and the, this med message gave them a code so that when they arrived at the building, all they had to do was swipe their phone at the security desk, and they could enter, and their host would be notified they were there. Step number one in becoming an urban mobility solutions provider instead of an elevator company. Philips was, for many years, a conglomerate. It sold consumer products. It sold x-ray machines. It designed the lighting for the Eiffel Tower. But most recently, it's decided that what it should do is create a healthier future. And so it's divested some of its businesses, and then it started connecting many of the others so that what it could do is move healthcare from being hospital-centric to being home-centric. And essentially what it wants to do is make people responsible and capable of looking after their own well-being. So it's connecting its x-ray machines and its EKGs and its um, uh, diagnostics around kidneys and, and uh, uh, diabetes and heart. And, and it's even connecting uh, consumer products like Fitbits and electric toothbrushes so that you can really learn about what's going on with your body and you can take charge of it. That's how it's transforming itself. 
Lego was a toy company, but it's thought about it and said, well, wait a minute, we should develop the builders of tomorrow. And what that would mean is not just manufacturing toys, but actually co creating a collaborative world for people to grow in. And so it's creating communities, virtual communities, where builders can build together. It's connecting educators to builders so that they can learn more about how to build effectively. It's creating opportunities to innovate on the web so that you can imagine new opportunities for building, and it's providing the building tool the, the Lego. So these companies are an example of companies that are addressing the first decision, which is, what is our vision for improving the lives of customers? Now, I know that essentially every company has a vision. It's on their website. But I would argue that in most cases, this vision is nothing more than a brief descri description of what they want to do. In the companies that we see actually successfully transforming, this vision is much more. It is their statement about how they're going to improve lives, and they enact it every day. They debate what it means. They try to wrestle with how they're going to make it happen, and it affects everything in the company from top to bottom. So at the top level, it affects what innovations they pursue and which innovations they say, eh, not quite appropriate. It affects people at the bottom because every single employee needs to understand how he or she will contribute to the vision of the company, to the value proposition. I would submit to you that a company that does not have a clear and active vision of how it will improve individual lives can create some cool apps, can introduce some new technologies, but it will not transform. If you do that, your second decision will be, what is our strategic driver? And, and this is an interesting question because what you're trying to do is uh, put your vision into action. Now the good news is you only have two choices. You can either decide you're gonna do customer engagement or you're going to do digitized solutions. One of these will drive your, your efforts towards uh, digitization. Now, if you choose customer engagement, what it means is you'll have a seamless experience for your customer across all channels. You'll have a cons consistent experience across all the steps of the customer journey. You'll be very responsive to customer demands. You'll offer a personalized experience because you will have all kinds of data and statistics and analytics that explain to you who your customer is and, and what that customer wants. And you'll create a collaborative environment where it makes sense so that individuals, customers, employees, partners can communicate with one another and collaborate when it makes sense. And if you do this, you are likely to have an experience like USAA. If you go to USAA's website, people have written things like, I love my bank. I am never leaving my bank. Who says that about a bank? And worse, who wants to compete with the bank that people say that about? That is what a great customer engagement strategy will do for you. But if that's not your cup of tea, you might instead decide what you'll, you'll drive with is a digitized solutions approach. That approach would, would involve a value-added package, bundling, integrated solution of your products and services. It involves a proactive approach. We don't wait to ask the customers what they need. We imagine what they could use, and we deliver it. We enrich that product, that solution, with information so you not only get a solution, you get information that will help you drive more value from that solution. And finally, it's boundaryless. If we don't have the product or service that's needed to fulfill our vision, we'll go out and get it from a partner. So this is what GE has done, for example. They, nobody said, came to GE and said, please, please, please build the industrial internet. That's what GE decided to do. And that is the, uh, that's, a, that's essentially what the digitized solution approach will, will, will look like. Now, it turns out that statistically, if you deliver one of these, you'll deliver the other. So your inclination will be to say, well, I'm just gonna go get both of those. That, I believe, is a mistake. Because it turns out that these two things 
are, would, you would approach them differently. And if you try to approach both of them at the same time, they'll, you know, they'll actually be in conflict. So you need to decide who's in charge here. At USAA, it is the member-facing people. They have the right to say to product people, you know, that product's a nice product, but it won't integrate. Or it's a nice product, but I think it'll confuse our customer. Not happening. That power is, is, is a recognition of what's going to drive. And at USAA, it is the member demands that will drive. Quite the opposite at Apple, right? We all know this is a product-driven company. And we know that because every customer-facing person out there tried to tell their, their product people that customers really want a little jack so they can put their headphone into their phone, right? But the product people said, no, 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 no. We know what's best for our customer. You sell it, right? And that is exactly what happens in digitized solutions. You sell it, which is happening at GE right now, right? We've got an industrial in internet. Go sell it. And that means we're going to eventually come up with a, 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 fat, a rather marvelous customer engagement strategy. So we will get both of these, but I would argue that if we go after both simultaneously, we are refusing to make the tough decision, which is which is going to dominate, which is going to set the stage. And if we don't make that decision, we can figure that every single decision has to be made by the executive committee. And that is quite a burden to bear. In the end, we simply won't be able to coordinate our decisions to pursue one of these two strate uh, strategies in a, in a logical fashion. The third decision, then, is what digital capabilities will we pursue? Now, we've been doing digital capabilities for a long time. I would argue that we started trying to build our operational backbone in the 1990s, about the time that ERPs came on the scene. And we've been working on this for a really long time. We understand the importance of seamless end-to-end -end transaction processing, of access to master data, of, of robust, reliable, secure operations. We all get that, and we've been working on this operational backbone for a long time. Well, here's the truth about the operational backbone. It was important before. We needed it for efficiency, for uh, reliability, but now we need it because it's table stakes. We do not get to play in the digital economy if we can't accomplish the basics. But the bad news is, it's not enough. Lego learned this the hard way. They said, well, you know, we are good at developing an operational backbone. We have created a totally transparent supply chain. We have revamped um, manufacturing and HR. We now have a product lifecycle management system that is disciplined, but it enables distributed innovation. Even our customers can innovate. And, and this is what, is what we need. And so I said in, to them in 2015, that is pretty cool. Tell me how that led you into becoming a real digital company. And they said, it didn't. What happened is all these startups saw our Lego brick and said, that's a cool thing, and they became digital. Our brick became the commodity, and we don't want to live like that. We have to become digital. So what they started to build is what we see going on at every company that's transforming into, the, into a digital company, and that is they're building a second platform, a digital services platform. This is where we build the apps. We build the, the common business components that will deliver to partners. It's how we integrate services for our digitized solutions. It relies on cloud. It relies on mobility. It relies on data and analytics. It includes IoT. There's often an AI layer. layer. Uh, this is about developing components rapidly and then allowing people to stitch them together so we can create offerings for customers. That's our digital capabilities. Now, the challenge is there's way too many opportunities. How do we figure out which ones to pursue? Well, we kind of know how to go about it with a, a, an operational backbone. We have developed target architectures for a long time. The bad news is that when we went out and surveyed companies last summer, we learned that only about 25% of big old companies actually have robust value-adding operational backbones. 
Now, if you happen to be in the 75% rather than the 25%, you've got a problem. The house is on fire, and as we know, this takes a long time to do. But because you need underlying operational capabilities to play in the digital economy, I would argue you better do something, you better do it fast. And it doesn't even matter how you do it. Go find a partner, cheat, it doesn't matter. It, you might have to do what Phillips did, divest some of the businesses that you just can't get to align with the others. This is serious stuff. We've got to get some underlying capability. And then once we've accomplished that, we have to make some decisions on these digital services because there's an overwhelming number of opportunities. If we let our employees do it, they'll all create digital services. And what we need to understand is, well, what are the critical capabilities that we're going to develop and then organize and reuse so we get real value from them? Now, in order to accomplish this, we're going to have to address decision number four, which is how will we architect our business? I've been wanting companies to architect themselves for a long time. Now is the moment, and it's not going to be easy. We have traditionally designed our companies by a, with a divide and conquer philosophy. So we would divide them into verticals, and we'd say, OK, you all address the uh, P&L for your organization, and we'll hold you accountable for it. And then to create some efficiencies, we'll layer on some horizontal processes. Now, the problem with that is when we get into a digital services world, we're talking about creating components that should integrate product lines, should create a single face to the customer, and there is no way this organization is going to cooperate. It, what we want in the digital economy is speed and integration, and if we try to do that with a divide and conquer mentality, Every time we try to do something, we're going to find ourselves going up the vertical, over, down, back up, over, down. Not happening. We are going to have to empower our people, find partners for them to work with, and that is going to prove to be hard. Uh, we've been studying this now for, for two years, and in all honesty, we see very little movement here. We see a lot of talk, very little movement. We have written a case study on what BNY Mellon is doing. Suresh Kumar, the CIO, has created service leaders in the IT unit. And these service leaders are assigned individual digital services. So they are simultaneously figuring out what service they need as they assign accountability for it. These uh, service leaders are mini CEOs. They are responsible for defining this service, understanding how to make it grow, develop it, keep it alive. I mean, basically, your digital components are living assets. These are not projects, and then you throw them on the shelf. They are how you will drive value from your business going forward. So you have service leaders who are taking accountability for a living asset, and then people in your company can stitch those assets together to deliver customer offerings. This is not easy. And because it's not easy, you will do it very incrementally. You do not want to just charge in and redesign your company. As you develop new com uh, components, you'll find leaders for those components, and you'll learn how to make them great. Suresh assures me this is not easy. And this fourth decision is why I believe digital transformations are going to prove to be much harder and take much longer than most people think. So let's summarize. You got four decisions to make. You'll need to define a grand vision. How are you going to change your customer's life? Uh, choose a strategic driver, uh, customer engagement, or digitize solutions. Then establish your critical digital capabilities. Stay focused here. Do what's most important. And finally, architect your business. Remember that digital services platforms require a very different organizational alignment from what you needed in your operational backbone. What happens if you don't do this? Well, it's going to be a sad story. And, and I, I don't think I'll go through these because it's just one sad word after the other. What I would argue is you want to you want to list these questions on your on your bulletin board, and you want to start checking them off. You want to know you're getting there. And I think if you do that, you will have a successful digital transformation. Thank you very much for your attention.
Well, thank you very much. I just have a, a couple of quick announcements. Um, is there a Rojes? Well, I'm going to say YR from Pega. Um, is he or she in the audience? Um, and I'm saying YR because it's something like Yega um, Ragesh or something, which I know I have butchered. Um, but the important thing is he or she is the winner of the MIT Sloan Professional Education Drawing. Um, and he or she has two free days of training um, here at MIT. Um, so congratulations. Um, and uh, uh, so earlier this morning, I introduced my friend Paul. Um, and so Paul is uh, the subject uh, today of my favorite tweet. Um, is from Sarah Castellanos, um, who tweeted, you know you're at MIT when? Um, and this is a tweet from Naomi um, Eddy, um, which I also mispronounced. I spy with my little eye a robot guest. <laughs> so um, we've had a very eventful day. Um, you have experienced drinking from the MIT fire hose. We've thrown an awful lot of out, you, out at you today. Uh, you have a lot to digest. Um, and at this moment, I would like to invite you to do a little more drinking, um, only this time out of a glass. Could be beer, it could be wine. Um, we have an innovation showcase uh, reception uh, outside in the tent. There'll be 10 innovative uh, startup companies uh, with very interesting and diverse solutions to a number of IT problems. Uh, so I encourage you to visit each of those booths. Uh, and uh, so let the networking begin. Thank you very much. <laughs>